This is chapter four, cellular structure. In this chapter, we are going to take a little tour inside the cell and then learn about all the cellular structures and organelles and how they work collectively to perform different cellular functions. Okay. Now Now, the first slide is really just a quick history on how cells were discovered. I'm going to make it very brief, so we're just going to mention two names. The first one is um, Robert Hooke, who was an experimental scientist. He actually first coined the term cell because he saw some box-like structures when he looked at a dead cork tissue. So those box-like structures are actually just dead plant cells. Um, so uh, he started calling them the cell. Okay. And then later, um, Anthony Leuvenhoek, oh, he was really great at crafting lenses. So he developed some even more advanced lenses, uh, which allowed him to see even smaller structures like a bacteria and the protozoa. Uh, if you do remember, we mentioned protozoa in module one, I think, when we talk about different domains and different classifications of organelles, or sorry, organisms. So protozoa are unicellular eukaryotic cells. A good example is the brain-eating amoeba, uh, right? They're just singular cells, um, but they can uh, infect humans. Uh, and they will feed on, you know, the brain tissues. So there was an incident a few years back at the white water center um, that killed a teenage girl. Okay. Uh, later, scientists continued to study cells, and they came up with a cell theory stating that all living things are composed of one or more cells. The cell is really the, ba the basic unit of life, and new cells arise from existing cells. So they don't come from nowhere. They have to have uh, existing cells that divide and make new cells. Okay, and next slide. Uh, just a just talks about how you know small the cells are, and we can't really study them uh, with with our naked eye, right? So we we'll have to use microscopes. Uh, this picture is interesting because I want to show you that you can actually tell a lot by just looking at the morphology of cells. So your textbook mentioned the type of job, um, cytotechnologist. technologist. So cyto means a cell. So cytotechnologist technologist will you know, prepare and look at cells and they can, you know, spot, uh, you know, abnormal cells. Okay? And this is probably an indication of certain diseases. So in this case, there are two groups of cells. This normal cells, uh, they look similar, right, to the uh, human cheek cells that we prepared in the lab. And this is a group of abnormal cells. Okay? So in comparison, you can see that these cells swelled a little bit, right? They're a little bit bigger. And two of the three cells have two nuclei inside the cell, and that's not normal. Okay? Usually, one cell should just have one nucleus. Okay? So this is a, a picture from a, a pap smear. So if you see this kind of cells, it probably indicates that uh, there may be cervical cancer, right? These are probably cancer cells. Okay. Now the next two slides is just going to uh, give you an overview of all the cell organelles in an animal cell and a plant cell. Okay. So one major difference is you can see that the plant cells have a rigid edge right, or cell outline and that's because they have a cell wall, a rigid cell wall. But when you look at animal cells, the shape is really kind of irregular, right? there's no rigid structure. So animal cells do not have a cell wall. So that's one of the major differences. You have to remember that. Okay, the first structure we're going to look at is cell walls. As I mentioned, the animal cells do not have a cell wall. For other organisms, um, plants, okay, fungal cells, or um, in certain protozoa, um, they do have a cell wall. Some prokaryotic cells also um, have a cell wall. So what are prokaryotic cells? Do you remember? Now, in the first module, we talk about three domains, right? Domain bacteria, domain archaea, domain eukarya. So domain, the first two domains, domain bacteria and archaea, all the organisms in those two domains, they're prokaryotic cells. They do not have a, uh, a nucleus, okay? Their DNA is not enclosed. Okay? Now, those prokaryotic cells, 
may have a cell wall. Not always, not all of them, but some may have a cell wall. Okay. <coughs> now the cell wall um, is rigid, so it protects the cell, provides structural support, and really gives the shape to the cell. Okay. Um, some of the interesting information uh, in plant cell, the major organic molecule in the cell wall is cellulose. Uh, hopefully you still remember that cellulose is a type of carbohydrate, right? And specifically, it's polysaccharide. Polysaccharide. It's made up of many, many glucose molecules all linked together. So it's a polymer. So um, this is the major component in plant cell wall. Now in prokaryotic cell walls, the chief component is peptidoglycan peptidoglycan. Now when you see this pept, that probably tells you that this is something about proteins, right? And the glycan is something about sugar. So this is actually um, <coughs> a very complex component that's made of proteins and sugar. Uh, interestingly, this is the target for uh, some of the antibiotics that we use. So those antibiotics can destroy the production of a peptidoglycan and destroy the cell walls. So if the cell walls are destroyed, you know, there's no production, so the bacteria cells uh, can die from it. So this is how some of the antibiotics work. All right, now once you cross the cell wall, only in certain cells, okay, you are going to reach the plasma membrane. So some people call it cell membrane, it's the same thing. So cell membrane is very important. It performs so many functions. It's not just, you know, the outlayer of the cell. We are going to have a chapter, you know, really look into the cell membrane. So in here, I'm just going to do a quick overview, just point out the, uh, you know, the few major structures and characteristics. Okay. Now, all cells have a plasma membrane. Okay. So I'm going to write it here because this is important. It's found in all cells. It doesn't matter if you are a prokaryotic cell or eukaryotic cell. Everything has to have a plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is um, composed of a phospholipid bilayer. So you can see this is a this is the top layer, this is a one layer phospholipid, and this is the second layer. So there are two layers. And when we talk about phospholipid, uh, if you remember, there's this a polar head, right? And then there are two fatty acid tails attached to that polar head. And these fatty tails are hydrophobic or nonpolar. So when you have this cell membrane structure, uh, you can see the hydrophobic fatty acid tails tend to be in the interior, right? They like to uh, stay away from water, so they want to be um, in the inside. And then the polar heads, because they contain a phosphate group, so they're polar, they carry negative charge, the polar heads love water. So the, the heads will point out, right? So the heads are on the exterior, okay? So that's a basic structure for the phospholipid bilayer. Now in in the cell membrane backbone, you're going to have a proteins embedded or spanning through the phospholipid bilayer. So all these blue structures, they indicate or they represent proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Okay. Now, some of the proteins may have some other stuff attached to it. Um, for example, over here, glycolipid. So that's a lipid with a carbohydrate attached to it. Um, and then glycoprotein, protein with a carbohydrate attached, attached to it. Okay, so that's what glyco mean, right? The carbohydrates. So um, a lot of times these components, glycolipids, glycoproteins, um, serve as cell surface markers. So um, this will help um, other cells to you know identify different cells, whether it's self cells or foreigners or you know foreign invaders. Okay, so they're pretty important. All right, so that's the cell membrane. Um, the cell membrane can form special structures. Uh, one good example is microvilli. Okay. Um, so when you look at this picture, this kind of shows you what microvilli are. So in this picture, you see three cells, right? So those are your intestinal cells. Okay. Um, on this side, the cells are attached to a layer, uh, probably some kind of connective tissue layer. And then on this side, they are pointing to the lumen uh, the empty space in your intestine. 
Okay. Now you can see the membrane forms a finger-like projections, right? You have some projections over here, over here, all those things. Those are called microvilli. So singular is microvillus, plural is microvilli. Now these microvilli are Im very important because they uh, maximize the surface area, the surface area for these intestinal cells to come into contact with the food that you ingest. Right. So on these microvilli, you have digestive enzymes, uh, and then this is also where the broken down uh, micromolecules, they become nutrients like glucose or fatty acids. This is also, the microvilli are also where they're going to cross and get into the bloodstream in your intestinal wall. Okay, so you can imagine, you know, the, the higher the surface area is, the more you can uh, absorb, right? So uh, it's a specialized area to kind of promote breakdown of micromolecules and absorption of nutrients. Um, with the people who have a celiac disease, their body tends to mount a very strong immune response to gluten. Okay, so when they eat something that has gluten, their body is going to think, oh no, this is a foreign invader, so we need to destroy gluten. So their body, you know, starts this immune response, and in that fight, in the fight against gluten, inevitably the microvilli get damaged, get destroyed. So without microvilli, um, you can't really absorb nutrients, and your ability to break down the micromolecules also decreases. So that's going to result in, you know, a wide, wide range of symptoms. You will probably um, suffer malnutrition because you can't absorb all the nutrients. Uh, you may also show some other symptoms like cramping and diarrhea, you know, because you can't break down those mo big molecules. The extracellular matrix, um, just remember that outside the cell, you actually have a lot of things. And all those things collectively we'll call the extracellular matrix, extra outside the cell. Okay? So the extracellular matrix is kind of sticky. Uh, it's not watery. It's not that watery. It's kind of, you know, kind of gel-like structure, very sticky. So the extracellular matrix uh, can hold the cells together to form tissues and also allows, to, allows the cells to kind of communicate between, you know, one another. So uh, it's pretty important. And we'll mention this a little bit more when we talk about cell communication. Okay. Now, let's say we cross the cell membrane and we are now entering cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is a very big area. It's everything. It contains everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Okay. Your textbook may say nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. It's the same thing. It's just the membrane that kind of defines the nucleus. All right. Um, in prokaryotes, which you know those cells don't have a nucleus, so the cytoplasm is really everything inside the cell. Okay. Um, in cytoplasm, you have the more watery-like component, or really gel-like component that's called a cytosol. Cytosol. Now, besides a cytosol, you may have something that's not dissolved in cytosol, something like a more solid. Uh, for example, cytoskeleton. Okay, so that's a network of fibers that supports the cell and gives the cell the shape. So that's one of the, um, you know, the, the solid things that you can find in cytoplasm. All right. So yeah, we often call cytoplasm uh, the factory floor. And that's because uh, most of the metabolic reactions um, happen in cytoplasm. So it's really like the floor of a factory where you do everything. You, you do all the productions.